Every time the Washington Commanders do 11 on 11 drills, it looks like we get a new offensive line with the first, second, third team every single time. And that, to me, is the best way for the Washington Commanders to figure out who their starting offensive line will end up being. That and more on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. You are Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders. And don't forget that you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you are hearing this episode. I'm your host, David Harrison, credential member of the media covering the Washington Commanders for CommanderGameDay.com. And I'm here with you every Monday through Friday. Greatly appreciate you for coming through for today's episode. Every dayers, I appreciate you coming through every single day on today's episode. We're going to talk about a less than stellar day for quarterback Jaden Daniels. We also heard from Jaden Daniels after practice. So we'll talk about a little bit of what he talked about with us. And we're going to focus in on the secondary group following Wednesday's practice. But first, every time the Washington Commanders offensive line takes the field this mini camp for a new set of 11 on 11s, it looks like a completely new line. Players are swapping teams, they're swapping positions, and that is exactly the way the Washington Commanders are going to figure out who their starting five is going to be. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create your account, use the code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. If you want to discuss this episode after it's over with me or anything else Washington Commanders related, all you have to do is reach out and text me directly, and you can do that by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders. Become a Locked On Commanders insider, and not only do you get one one-on-one conversations with me outside the episode. You also get inside access with me to information, analysis, news during practices, during press conferences, during games. You even get bonus content like B-roll footage of practices that we can't share here on the program. So again, join subtext.com slash locked on commanders to get in on that fun today. Every time the Washington Commanders take the field for 11 on 11 drills this minicamp, the offensive line looks different. And we're not just talking first team. We're talking second team. We're talking third team. Brandon Coleman and and Cornelius Lucas were swapping for the most part yesterday, first day of mandatory minicamp. And Cornelius Lucas got most of these starting or first team uh, left tackles, less left tackle snaps compared to his rookie counterpart today. Brandon Coleman got almost all of the left tackle spots or snaps at for the, with the first team, if not all of them. Again, my eyes are floating around a little bit, but I can tell you that Brandon Coleman at least started every single first team 11 on 11 session as the left tackle. Meanwhile, Cornelius Lucas was getting second team reps at right tackle. Andrew Wiley getting first team reps at right tackle, which is where I think he'll end up being. And that's really been the only consistent part is Tyler Biotish. Uh, right guard Sam Cosme, right tackle Andrew Wiley, basically kind of appear to be locked in as your starting middle to right side of the offensive line for the Washington Commanders. It's the left side, the left tackle position and the left guard position. I think a lot of us assume that Nick Allegretti will end up winning that job. And truthfully, that's still my belief to this point uh, in the process and then through minicamp so far with one day left to go. But Michael Dieter did get some opportunities there with the first team offensive line next to Brandon Coleman. And it's interesting because Again, we've seen Brandy Coleman with the second team. We've seen Michael Dieter with the second team. So is that the second team left side with the first team right side? And really what this was all boils down to is I don't think we should get wrapped too much into the semantics or the labels of who's a first team or who's a second team or all this stuff. Really what it boils down to is this coaching staff putting into action really what we've been told all off season long, which is they want competition at as many positions as possible, really every position. But I mean, let's be honest, Terry McLaurin's job pretty much safe, right? I think Zach Ertz is the number one tight end. Tight end is pretty much a done deal. But there are certainly a lot of other areas like the left guard position, like the left tackle position, where you see some competition and the commander's coaching staff is doing everything they can to get that competition in there. Remember Dan Quinn said not too long ago that as they get through this process, they're going to find opportunities to say, hey, listen, today these reps are going to be yours. We want to see how you do in them. Next day, those reps might belong to somebody else. We want to see how they do in them. And it's all about taking advantage of those reps showing comfortability within the scheme and showing the ability to execute uh, when the pressure is on and in the live snaps. I'll tell you, Brandon Coleman, for the most part, looked pretty solid. No pads, no live pass rush, no big you know, hits or anything like that. But for the most part, he did look solid. Michael Dieter, on the other hand, a little bit rocky, a little bit less of a, of a secure footing uh, for him on the day. Did give up some early pass rush pressures uh, up the middle that Jaden Daniels had to kind of react to. Certainly not what you want to see. However, there was one play, we'll get to it in just a little bit, 
uh, where Jaden Daniels reacted to it, made a really good play that I think he would have gotten away with. Again, it's hard to tell when they're not actually able to hit or go full speed, but it looks like he got out of there in time, even if it was full speed, even if John Allen, Deron Payne were allowed to try to tackle uh, the young quarterback. Doesn't look like they would have actually gotten to him, and he would have made a pretty amazing play that a lot of you will be very happy to see if it transforms or translates rather to the playing field this preseason or especially uh, this regular season. But then you look at the second team, like I said, Cornelius Lucas getting some work as a right tackle in the second team, Trent Scott getting some work uh, left team or left tackle with the second team. And of course, Nick Allegretti, if he's not out there with the first team, he's in there with the second team. And then you even see a guy like Alex Akinbulu, who spent his entire time with the Washington Commanders, basically on the practice squad. He's been on the active roster a few times, uh, enough times to have a year of credit and not be allowed to attend the rookie minicamp. Um, but he was in there with the second team, Marcus Mariota, as the right tackle for a period of time. So the Washington Commanders really doing everything they can to mix and match, cycle guys in. Let's see who who plays well here, who plays well there. And I think it's really important because when we look back at the offensive lines that we've seen from the Washington Commanders over the recent years, we've talked a lot about how some guys individually, right? Center Nick Gates comes to mind. Love the dude. Great guy to get to know. But at the end of the day, the job just did not get done. Really kind of looked singularly like he was not fulfilling everything that he needed to do as a starting center for the team last year at times. But then there's other positions where I've seen sometimes he looks like Charles Leno maybe completely blew an assignment or just completely missed a blocker. And certainly sometimes he did. But at the same time, there are other times where you kind of look and say, look, he's trying to cheat this way or try to slide this way to help out his teammate, his left guard mate. Uh, and that maybe cost him in his position and makes him look worse than he actually did because he's trying to cover up somebody else's mistake. Uh, speaking of left guards, Chris Paul actually just kind of popped in my head right now. Uh, got some right guard work on uh, on a Wednesday as well. So interesting things going on on the offensive line. And I think that when you talk about the best starting five, you're not just talking about the best individual players. Like we can put these guys in a vacuum and say, you're a left tackle, you're a left tackle, you're a left tackle. All of you come out here, kick slide, get back, get in your set, do all your stuff. And I can say, boom, you look the cleanest, you look the smoothest, boom, you're the number one guy. Take the left guards, same thing. You're the best left guard. But if I put those two players, that left tackle, that left guard together, and they don't work well together, now they both look bad, right? But if you take maybe the best in a vacuum left tackle and the second best left guard, put them together, they work better in sync then it's a better left side. So it's it's really kind of a nuanced thing. And it's a part where we've talked about this, this five man units got to work as one. So it really just kind of matters how they all interact. It's like chemistry. It's not just building blocks, not taking the five strongest bricks you have, put them together to make your wall. No, they're chemistry. There's, there's, there's neurons and there's molecules and I'm getting out of my depth because science was not one of my strong suits in school. But you get what I'm saying, hopefully. It's how they work together, how they dance together. Uh, in a lot of ways. So the Washington Mirrors coaching staff definitely going through the steps of making sure they have as many looks, as many different combinations as they can. And I think it's really cool. Plus, you're giving different looks to your quarterbacks. You're making your quarterbacks kind of react to different things. You can't just, you know, maybe I, I trust Nick Allegretti a little bit as that left guard more than I trust Michael Dieter. But look, I can't just get comfortable and, and do that. I've got to make sure that I'm on my toes and react. And we certainly saw some of that out of quarterback Jane Dan. So I know a lot of you have had some questions about the offensive line. I've had it myself. I got one more day. I'm trying to wrap up this week, having some answers here with some favorites here. And right now the coaching staff make it a little bit interesting on who those favorites might be entering the, uh, the off period before we hit training camp. But I'm going to do my best to get one more day. We're going to put eyes on. We're going to try to come back with some answers for you. Speaking of trying to get some answers for you, the secondary has some interesting position battles potentially brewing. But there's one that I thought would be a position battle. And it turns out it may not be. Emmanuel Forbes may be a starting cornerback for the Washington Commanders. I'll tell you why I'm catching that hint right now. Coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked On Commanders brought to you by Game Time. Game Time makes the NBA Finals tickets even faster and easier, makes getting tickets to the NBA Finals even faster and easier. Prices on Game Time actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. Plus, they got last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of getting your NBA Finals tickets. NBA Finals Game 3 is happening as I'm recording this right now. So whatever that happens, if my prediction comes true, then Friday may be the last chance that we all get to watch NBA action in live action before next season begins. If you're in Dallas, you can see Game 4 of the NBA Finals at the American Airlines Center with tickets starting at $670 a piece. 
best value for your money will cost you a little bit over $2,000, but they will identify that best value for you if you want it. Fans in Boston can join the Celtics for a watch party Friday night for as low as $73. Take the guesswork out of buying NBA Finals tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create your account, use code Locked On NFL to get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create your account. Redeem the code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-F-L for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thanks again for making Locked On Commanders your first listener, your first view today and every day. Every day, thanks for coming through. Make sure you come back tomorrow. We're going to wrap up our mandatory mini camp experience. Not going to wrap up our coverage or discussions of it because we still got a lot of things to talk about. But I am going to come back and try to answer those three questions that we started the week with. In the meantime, make sure you're checking out Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every single day to bring you the biggest stories without all of the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Just got done talking about the extensive rotating, shuffling, mismatching, matching, mixing, uh, of the Washington Commanders offensive line. I do have a little bit of a weary uh, thought about that offensive line situation because, and I go back to uh, a little bit of knowledge I had that last year, New York media a little bit, Giants fans a little bit, got a little, I don't want to say frustrated, confused, concerned about how long it took the New York Giants to really solidify their starting five. And when they had struggles, there were some people who kind of attributed those struggles to how long it took the Giants to solidify their starting five. Bobby Johnson, Washington Commanders offensive line coach, former offensive line coach of the New York Giants. So as we see this mixed match, as we see all these testing, it's good right now. And I stand by that in June. But if we get into the end of July, early August, and we still don't have a solidified starting five, I think you need to get that solidified starting five, at least by the second preseason game. If you go into the first one, you're kind of like, wait, let's see this combination in action. And you're and you and you do all those things. I think by the second, you need that starting five to get at least two preseason games worth of action before you get to the regular season. But obviously, we'll worry about that when the time comes. Speaking of worrying about things, the secondary. Uh, We've been worried about a lot of things. Manuel Forbes' development, whether or not he's going to be replaced by Michael Davis, Benjamin St. Juice's ability to bounce back, Derek Forrest. But I will tell you that of all these position battles, and I'm not going to solidify all my opinions on them right now, but I'm starting to lean towards Manuel Forbes potentially being a starting cornerback right now, having the edge in that race against Michael Davis. But before we talk fully about that, I do want to give – a tip of the cap to Quan Martin, free safety, defensive back, whatever you want to call him. Quan Martin, second year player out of Illinois, had the play of the day on Wednesday. An interception thrown by Marcus Mariota, if my memory serves correctly. I believe that's uh, correct because I remember I was talking to somebody uh, about it. But the ball goes up. It's a, it's a look, it's a good decision. It's the right route to throw to. It's the right decision making that play. Marcus Mariota just leaves the ball a little bit short. Quan Martin goes up. And first goes up with one hand, snags the ball out of the air, doesn't isn't able to secure it, tips it behind himself and then somehow has the dexterity. Remember, this dude is running full speed, jumping in the air, eyes on the ball, eyes on on, 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 on an opponent, doing all these things, moving one way. The ball's going the other way. He's able to secure the ball behind his back, run it back for a pick six. Do want to also tip my cap to uh, right, top, right, right guard Sam Cosme, who chased Quan Martin all the way down in the end zone, put in a lot of effort to try to chase down his teammate there. So that's what you want to see from a leader on this team. But uh, Quan Martin, I know the Washington Commanders did some social on it. I knew one of my insiders sent me an Instagram post that they put up of it. I believe there was a tweet about it. Go check out all the Washington Commanders socials. If you can find that play, it's it's a good play to watch. And it was definitely an impressive play uh, to see firsthand. So Quan Martin in the defense. Very, very happy about that. But let's get to these competitions, right? Emmanuel Forbes versus Michael Davis. Uh, I kind of pulled some other media members. I myself told you here on the program, on Locked On Commanders, that to me, if I had to pick a name right now, that would probably be the starter opposite of Benjamin St. Juice, who I do feel like is not necessarily cemented, but maybe pasted in as a starting cornerback outside for the team this year. I would give the tip to Michael Davis, the tip, the, the tip of the cap to Michael Davis. But the more I watch, guys, the more I'm starting to notice Emmanuel Forbes is definitely getting the majority of the first team work as that other uh, perimeter corner. And it's something that I really kind of focused in on today. Now that's not to say that Michael Davis isn't getting any, because again, this coaching staff, just like on the offensive line, they're mixing and they're matching, they're swapping and they're switching and, and they're doing all these things. But Emmanuel Forbes, when it is the quote unquote first team defense is definitely getting more reps right now than Michael Davis, at least from what I'm noticing. And again, 
There's 22 guys on the field. There's coaches on the side. There's players on the side. So I can't see every single rep. But from what I am seeing from the cornerbacks, Emmanuel Forbes certainly looks like he might have a little bit of an advantage here. I'm going to keep another eye on it tomorrow, and we'll kind of see how we come back when we wrap up the mini camp observations. Christian Holmes in the slot today, something that I'm sure hasn't, you know, it's not like it's never happened before, but something that kind of stood out to me, him and Mike Sanders still, uh, we're kind of going back and forth in the slot, uh, you know, taking reps and and doing all these things. And I think it's very interesting because when you look at this outside cornerback situation, the manual for Benjamin St. Juice, they bring in Michael Davis. There's Noah Igbenogany who was getting some slot work as well, but he's also got some experience as a perimeter corner. Like you kind of just wonder like, where are they going to fit all these guys in? And Christian Holmes, Tariq Castro Field specifically are two players that have shown some promise. They've shown some flashes in their abilities to play for the Washington Commanders over these last couple of years. Uh, but they're just not quite, they're kind of just not fitted into a spot right now. So Christian Holmes getting some slot work. Very interesting to me. Again, just another sign that this coaching staff is following through on what they said, which is we're going to experiment. We're going to put guys in places maybe they've never been before, see if we can tap into some unknown potential uh, that we want to see. Getting back to the safeties and Quan Martin, man, a lot of different combinations. And they were in there with first team defense and second team defense. I mean, just all over the place. Quad Martin and Percy Butler on the field at one time together, basically two free safeties. And that's an interesting situation. I mean, if you've got third and third and eight, third and 12, right. And you've got a pass happy team. Why not put two free safeties out there? Give them that look. Of course, Quan Martin and Jeremy Chin, kind of the duo that we expect to probably be the starters when the season comes, you know, here in a month and a half or two months. Uh, those two obviously were on the field as well, but we also saw looks with Quan Martin and Derek Forrest, Jeremy Reeves and Percy Butler. Uh, like these safeties are definitely getting in there. They're mixing their matching again. Like I said, the defense, like you as a media member observing, you really have to be on your toes. That first set of 11 on 11. So you're just out there and they're not waiting for you. Like they're not standing there saying, okay, guys, you got all the names that are on the, on the field right now. No, they're not doing that favor for us. Cause that'd be great, but they don't have time for that. Um, but once you get past that, like first set of 11 on 11s, especially on defense, man, I mean, you could just see any combination of players on defense once you get past that first set of 11 on 11s. So it's really interesting to see them doing uh, a lot of this. Also got some looks at this is a secondary specific, but Jamin Davis coming off the edge had a really good bend uh, against one of the undrafted free agent uh, tackles. Uh, you know, just just a really good look from him. And, and you know, so you, you're starting to see some promise there uh, from Jamin Davis. Overall, uh, oh, it's observations of the secondary and insiders. You're going to get the practice footage from Wednesday. So when you get that, there's going to be a portion of the secondary training uh, that I captured for you guys where they're hitting sleds and they're hitting heavy bags. And that is not something you would have seen last year, right? Like last year, what you would have seen the last two years, last three years, really, what you would have seen is this team, the secondary dodging yoga balls and hitting tackling dummies, which tackling dummies, and then you hit a tackling dummy, you're not even t- tackling dummy to the ground, you're actually hitting a tackling dummy onto a mat that, you know, gives you a nice soft uh, cushion and, and you know, safety first and all that stuff and all about it. But you transition from that, now they're hitting sleds and you're hitting heavy bags. And it was really interesting um, because you can see in the footage, if you watch it, Insiders, the coaches, like you can see them talking these guys through and and some of these guys don't know how to hit a heavy bag. Like they just legitimately don't understand that at one point in time, there was a coach uh, who the DB coach was sitting there with some of his guys saying, Hey guys, listen, you know, this heavy bag is hanging from almost like a swing set type of scenario. Right. And then like, when you hit this bag, you don't want one of your feet off the ground, right? Like a lot of the guys were front foot is planted back foot is off the ground and they're trying to get leverage onto this heavy bag. He's like, no, you want both feet on the ground. Like you want to come up and time it to where your steps are both on the ground and you're engaging and you're using both your legs as leverage, basically teaching these DBs how to tackle from that type of emotion. And it just kind of shows you that some of the things that we take for granted that oh, why would an NFL player know how to do that or understand how to do that? You only know what you've been taught. And that's what these players are talking about. They're teaching them things. They're learning new things, much more aggressive, playing faster. Really interesting to watch. So hopefully again, insiders, like I said, you'll have that, that footage. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed seeing that uh, as much as I did. And, Look, it's, it's producing on the field. You're seeing tip passes become interceptions, which how many times, Commanders fans, have you watched with me and with us, uh, tip passes fall to the ground, right? Tip passes are getting intercepted. The bottom line is that they're getting tipped. There was a screen pass to Brian Robinson uh, during one of the 11-on-11 11 11 sessions on Wednesday where he would have been dead to rights, man. That's like a three, four-yard loss because the DB was just, boom, right on top of it. Again, aggression in action, but intelligent aggression. Uh, really good, really good to see from the defense. That defense is flying around. And if that translates to the preseason, translates into these joint practices, and then into the regular season, you guys are going to have a lot of fun watching that defense. Certainly having a lot of fun watching them at practice today. Also having a lot of fun watching 
Jaden Daniels practice and develop as a quarterback. We got to hear from the quarterback on Wednesday. One thing that he said really stood out because we talked about it yesterday. That's coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Wrap it up this episode of Locked On Commanders. We saw again Jane Daniels on the practice field. We heard from Jane Daniels after practice. And first, what we saw, and I, I kind of talked about this in the beginning of the episode, a less stellar day. And I want to make sure you understand that not less than stellar, less stellar. Not a bad day by any means. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of like big splash plays, not a whole lot of highlight plays. There was one play that I kind of indicated earlier uh, in 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 the, uh, in the in the episode here, where uh, again Michael Dieter left guard. I presume will be the backup left guard, but right now he's getting his opportunities. Uh, kind of just missed a missed a block. You know what I mean? Let a guy in. I think it was Deron Payne that he let get in really fast, got right into Jaden Daniels' grill. And Jaden has actually talked about in his post practice interview about how quickly guys like Deron Payne and John Allen can get in there and how that's different from the NFL game. Again, remember college, everybody is a college athlete, but some of those guys are accountants now versus being college football players last year. In the NFL, they're all football players, like they're all good. Uh, even the backups are, are really, really good. So, um, but there was one play where, yeah, that, you know, Dieter, you know, again, in my eyes, kind of blew the block there. Pass rush got in really quick on Jaden, but Jaden was able to escape really, really quickly. And the defense was kind of caught in man coverage. And the route combination that the commanders had dialed up, that Cliff Kingsbury had dialed up for his offense, really flooded one side of the field. So when Jaden got out of the pocket away from the pass rush, he made it out to the edge. There was nobody in front of him, guys. I mean, he ran like 40 yards before he ran out of bounds. Basically, was chased down by a defender. And I'm telling you right now, that dude wasn't going full speed. I mean, and you know, we talked to uh, I think was, we talked to Jahan Dotson after practice, a uh, group of us, and he mentioned that too. And he was like, that dude could have taken that thing 80 yards to the house. You know what I mean? That's one of those plays, and you kind of look ahead. And I don't want to get too far ahead here, but you look ahead to like Week One against Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I know the Buccaneers very well. I actually still cover the Buccaneers for Buc- uh, Buccaneers for Bucks game day part of Sports Illustrated. I'm not obviously as tuned into them as I am the Washington Commanders, but I still definitely keep a, a peripheral eye on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I know Todd Bowles and his defense very well. He's a very aggressive, very man-heavy defense. I'll tell you what, guys. You catch Todd Bowles' defense in that type of a man cover scenario with that type of a play call on or that type of route tree on where it takes all those defenders out of the box, Jaden Daniels would be gone for, for, for a very long, exciting uh, touchdown. Now the Buccaneers do have some speed in their secondary, so I don't know if you can outrun all those guys. But still, uh, something that you kind of see at practice, and you're like, I know, I know a guy, I know an opponent that he's going to see where uh, that play might work. Like that whole thing might actually come to fruition. So hopefully, you guys get to see it in Week One. Uh, certainly would not be bad for you guys to see. Overall, you know, again, uh, good decision making. Uh, certainly some some high passes that we've seen. Uh, certainly some off target passes. I think you know that's that's ultimately what you're going to get from a lot of guys. There was one ball. He was trying to get to Austin Eckler, ended up in the dirt. You don't want to see that. But not the worst day of practice I've ever seen from a quarterback, but certainly not as good, per se, as, say, the first day or even some of the other practices we've seen from him. But the most important part was getting to talk to Jaden Daniels. Again, we get to talk to him basically once man- mandatory through during every phase. We'll talk to him a couple times during training camp. But a couple of moments during the Jaden Daniels press conference after practice, and if you haven't seen it yet, the Washington Commanders certainly streamed it uh, on their YouTube page, so you can go check that out. But something he talked about, he was asked about kind of what the biggest challenge has been for his adjustment from the college game to the NFL game. And he said that the learning curve of how to be a pro is something that he's really kind of had to catch up to. And he talked about that previously before or at rookie minicamp about wanting to learn how to be a pro and do those things and having that routine, learning the playbook, do stuff like that. And it's interesting to hear Jaden talk about how that's kind of been one of his biggest adversities because it's something that he's been praised a lot for by his teammates and by his coaches and then he was asked kind of about that too, about the arriving earlier. And I think this kind of just goes to show you this guy's mentality where he's talking about like, I really, you know, I'm, I'm learning and I need to keep learning. And I, and I think that's my biggest you know, hurdle to clear is learning how to be a pro. But then the very next question, he's talking about how he's showing up at 545 in the morning to the facility. He's doing a walkthrough in the bubble, not a team walkthrough, not a mandatory walkthrough. He is conducting a walkthrough of what they're going to be doing in practice, what he's been studying in the playbook. Then he's watching film, doing things like that. And then he's got his mandated meetings, mandated walkthrough, mandated practice. And not only is it him, but it's also Luke McCaffrey. Well, let's go back to draft night, right? We talk about Luke McCaffrey. We talk about the bloodline. And yes, the exciting part of that bloodline is talent, right? Ed McCaffrey, Super Bowl winning multiple time, Super Bowl winning NFL you know, uh, wide receiver. 
Christian McCaffrey, arguably when he's healthy, the most electric player, one of the most electric players in the National Football League, just got a well-deserved extension with the San Francisco 49ers. You know, certainly a piece of their Super Bowl window still being open. Those guys know the NFL. This family knows the NFL business of the National Football League. So when you hear Luke McCaffrey is coming in there with Jade and doing these walkthroughs together, that's a receiver who's not only building really great chemistry with his with his quarterback, helping his quarterback accelerate. So, you know, you you can kind of tie it directly or indirectly. Like if, if Jaden Daniels is able to connect with Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dodson earlier than you expect him to, Luke McCaffrey is having a hand in that because he's out there running these routes. And oh, by the way, there was questions earlier on about Luke McCaffrey. Is he only a slot guy? I can tell you right now, he's not only a slot guy and the Washington commanders know it. And they're definitely planning on exposing that to the rest of the National Football League. But Luke McCaffrey... Another rookie who's coming in here early with his quarterback to be a pro's pro. And if you're Jaden, you look at that Luke McCaffrey guy, and you say, hey, man, your family knows how to do this and do this the right way. Definitely a good guy to be teaming up with. One of the interesting parts of the press conference was Jaden Daniels asked about being a star quarterback. And I think it's even one step further. We talked about earlier this week about Jaden Daniels is not even a starter yet, right? He's a first team quarterback in practice right now. But right now, that is it. He, there, there's no depth chart. There's no official announcements of starters. And I know some other teams have done it, right? I know like the Chicago Bears announced Caleb Williams is going to be their starting quarterback. And I get that. And, that. and that's all great. But what this coaching staff, again, is doing, we've talked about this a lot, is they're not doing anything before it's time. There's no reason to name a starting quarterback right now. Is Jaden Daniels going to be the starting quarterback of the Washington Commanders? Yeah, at some point he's going to. I asked Dan Quinn on Tuesday. I said, hey, look, coach, you know, the outside expectation – is that eventually Jane Daniels is going to be the starter. What do you need to see out of him for that to happen or for you to be comfortable to make that announcement? And he didn't sit here and be like, there's no promises that Jane's ever going to start. And da, da, da. No, he, he basically accepted the question, accepted the reality, and then gave me an answer about what he wants to see, not just from Jane, but from all of his players to be starters. So everybody knows that that's the expectation. The next step after that is to be a star quarterback, right? So getting asked about star and, and, you know, in a lot of ways you can say that he is a star. There's a lot of press about him. There's a lot of excitement about him. People are buying his jerseys. They want his autographs, right? So yes. And in, in some ways, when you talk about being a star quarterback, that is something that Jaden is looking at as being earned. So his response to ask being asked about being a star quarterback in DC, he said, quote, I ain't a star quarterback yet. I got a long way to go. I'm a rookie to answer that. But just coming out here, just being able to experience different things. That was my first time throwing out a first pitch. We talked about the Washington Nationals first pitch shortly before that. That was my first time going to the soccer game, just seeing the atmosphere and seeing different sports and be able to just go out there and supporting them coming into a new town, a new community, be able to go out there and support and showing them love. So when our season comes around and the, and the players of the Nationals game or people at Team USA for soccer want to come to a game, they can and they can show some love too. end quote. So. Jaden Daniels knows, like, yes, he's doing the tour. He's shaking the hands. He's kissing the babies. He's taking the pictures. But he hasn't earned that star category yet. And I think that's what you want out of your quarterback is I'm not a star until I go out there. First, I got to shake the rookie annotation. So when we talk about Jaden being a star quarterback or being a starter quarterback, there's nothing wrong with the with the question. The question was a great question because, again, like Jaden Daniels, arguably the most popular player in Burgundy and Gold these days, you know, from a, from a notoriety standpoint. But as good as the question is, love, love, love the answer. And I think hopefully Washington Commanders fans, you love that answer as well. That's going to wrap up today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Come back tomorrow. We're going to wrap up our mini camp thoughts. And I'm going to give you my answers for the three questions we came in trying to answer. We already got the answers for some. We're going to recap those and we'll solidify some answers as we hit the (gasps) dreaded dead period between mandatory mini camp and training camp. In the meantime, you got questions or comments about the Washington Commanders, you can drop them in the YouTube comment section or text me directly. Become a Locked On Commanders insider at joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders. Don't forget, make sure you check out Locked On Sports Today, the first ever 24-7 live streaming sports channel on YouTube. And as always, thank you for making Locked On Commanders your first listen or your first view today and every day, every day's, every dayers. Thanks for coming through as you do. Until we speak again, if you're on about, please be safe, be kind, and we'll see you right back here next time for another episode of Locked On Commanders part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.